Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. This is episode 181 of the Team House. We're here tonight with our guest, Jeff Stein. Jeff served in Vietnam as a case officer, an Army case officer in Da Nang, and he has been a longtime national security investigative journalist. He is the editor of Spy Talk. Uh, you guys can find it out there right now. Go subscribe to it. Uh, there's not just Jeff, but a whole series of uh, journalists and experts, subject matter experts that write for the website on all sorts of national security issues, on defense, espionage, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, people who watch this, uh, this podcast or, or listen to it will definitely get a kick out of the, the kind of work that Jeff and his colleagues do. Um, so, Jeff, thank you for joining us on a Friday evening. Oh, I, I, I couldn't be anywhere else. Where would I be except with you guys? <laughs> so, Jeff, uh, I, I'd like to kind of start off by asking you uh, uh, to tell us your origin story, kind of about your upbringing and what took you towards uh, service in the military, uh, especially during the Vietnam years. Well, those two are linked, as, as they often are. I grew up in a, a kind of a, a Republican home, a moderate Republican. We didn't have moderate. They were just Republicans. Uh, they were big admirers of Rockefeller and that wing of the Republican Party. Anyway, they were Republican and, and family. And, and when you grew up in that era, you know, when you got your draft notice, you kind of went. You know, uh, I I never had a thought. Uh, I, I really hadn't formed a hard opinion that early on in the Vietnam War about it, except that, you know, it was pretty... Uh, odd what was going on over there but my dad had been in the navy uh my uncle had been in the navy all my relatives had done military service my brother had done his two years in the army so it was kind of death taxes in the army kind of you, you did it you did your two years and you got out and went on with your life it was just it was a universal draft back at, back then which people under 40 probably don't know much about or what it was like to live with that but it was just part of your life you had to do your military service and move on it wasn't until later you know like 68 and so on especially 69 when there was widespread resistance to the draft because of the vietnam war um so anyway you know i i did sort of little feints and half-hearted maneuvers to, to not be drafted uh, but, uh, I just tested the system too much. I went down to Martha's Vineyard. I was playing in a folk trio. <laughs> that was quite an era. <laughs> and I got my draft notice. I threw away the first one, but then the second one, they said, no, we're serious. You know, <laughs> we're going to arrest you if you don't show up. So anyway, uh, I had a, uh, this good friend of mine who I'm going to name because he might be watching Bob Cooper in, in Rhode Island. He was in army, uh, uh counterintelligence and, I asked him for advice. He says, I can get you into it. I can help get you into intelligence. Uh, so you can avoid the draft because the draft then, at that point, in late 66, early 67, you were pretty much guaranteed to go straight into the infantry uh, in Vietnam, the big muddy. And I didn't like... I like to say I didn't even like camping, so I knew I would be no good at the uh, get as, a, as a grunt. So... Anyway, so I imagined uh, I managed to elude the draft board and get into intelligence, which meant I'd sign up for an extra year. Uh, but if it, it, it kept me out of the big money, that was fine. So I went into uh, so I had no real idea what it was going to be, some kind of spooky business. Yeah, I mean, the CIA and all that stuff hadn't been written about back then. Um, there was uh, the CIA. Uh, the Invisible Government, I think it was called. It was a book out there, but that was about it. There wasn't much written about it, so I didn't really know what I was getting into I, I mean, until even, the first day of class. Day, even to this day, Jeff, I don't think people really understand that the Army has case officers, that the Army has people who do similar things in the intelligence field. Yeah, it, well, it's a, now a career branch, I think, in the Army. Uh, it wasn't when I was in. But anyway, you know, the first day of class at uh, the school was then at Fort Hollibird. Um, in, uh, let me turn off the, uh, uh, alerts. Um, um, put on do not disturb. Okay. So the first day they said, uh, 
they pulled down the blinds and put a big red secret sign on the wall uh, and said, uh, this is the only thing you can volunteer for uh, in the Army and get out of it uh, if you change your mind after what we've told you. And so they explained we're going to be taught espionage, and, and some people find that immoral, unethical, distasteful, or whatever, um, because you're going to be involved in illegal ap activity, activities that are illegal when they're practiced in foreign countries. So uh, if you want out, uh, you know, raise your hand, and you can leave. And so one guy did raise his hand at the end, and he got out, and later uh, – you know, he was around the base for uh, 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 several weeks more before he got his transfer. And it turns out he went into uh, ballistic missiles. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more, a lot more ethical. Yeah. Anyway, it was a boy's life. You you, you learn how to do all the spy stuff. You know, uh, invisible writing and secret. You know, micro uh, uh, cameras and and dead drops and brush passes and all the stuff of espionage. You get to learn that stuff and carry out a exercise which started in a submarine uh, in Long Island Sound, paddling ashore, uh, you know, and then going on my mission. One of my classmates acted as a case officer for me, sent me on a mission, it turned out to Minneapolis to photograph a power station and to contact a uh, a stay behind agent, somebody playing the role of a stay behind. And then I sent a classmate on a mission. It's just fascinating. Uh, it was all, uh, all the training was uh, predicated on, you know, you would go to Berlin or something, you know, some did, European place. Did it, uh, did it surprise <laughs> had, you at all? Had Jeff? little to do with Vietnam. Did, did it surprise you at all that you took to the training and, and were so excited about it, you know, being almost this erst no. erst erstwhile draft dodger? They do this vetting, uh, you know, uh, all these personality tests on you, and they know what they're looking for. <laughs> and they must have found something slippery in my character, now, at, you know, at, and said, this guy's for us. At the time, was this a relatively new program for the Army? And were you tied in with the CIA at that time, or was it kind of its own separate thing? Well, I ended up being tied in with him, but, you know, there was uh, the w World War II era OSS, uh, you know, was essentially, it was a military uh, service, right? I mean, it was it had arm's length difference, distance from the Army, uh, but it was essentially a military uh, service doing stay-behind operations, uh, uh, sabotage, uh, and spying in World War II. Uh, and then the military service, Services started, particularly the army, started doing its own spying missions in, during the Korean War, um, and then uh, in Vietnam, the Green Berets were doing some espionage uh, and stay behind operations uh, in concert with CIA in the very early '60s, late '50s, early '60s. Um, I uh, I operated in kind of a, another level of secrecy in Vietnam. It was called a unilateral collection operation. We didn't we didn't identify ourselves to the South Vietnamese authorities. We considered them every bit as much of the enemy as the communists because we knew they were infiltrated by the communists, and we wanted to do our own operation. So I took over an ongoing operation that was targeting um, the headquarters of North Vietnamese forces in the in the South. And I had one principal agent I worked through, and uh, he had sub-agents who were rice peddlers and woodcutters and stuff like that who, who would work, or merchants, who would be operating in the areas controlled by the communists, and they would come back and report back on uh, pretty strictly military intelligence. You know, the, the 141st North Vietnamese Steel Regiment is encamped at such and such coordinates and they have such and such weapons and they are training to do such and such. Uh, their uniforms are such and such, their insignia and so on. It was pretty much strict military intelligence. But about six months in, uh, I was pressed to do more political intelligence on the communist underground. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got caught up in a lot of cross currents um, because there were a number of political factions uh in in uh, South Vietnam, but um, uh, one of my the main customers for that information was the CIA, the Phoenix program, right? Um, and so I got to know. In fact, I uh, because I was a, a total rookie at this, you know, in all the trades craft, trade craft, 
and so on. And I would be nervous going out to meet my agent, you know, in some sh shady hotel room someplace, you know, all the, doing all the counter surveillance and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I, I got to know the CIA base chief pretty well, and I would drink cognac on his balcony at night it would have, and there'd be a bunch of air america pilots coming through and i knew so i knew a lot of the secret air operations that were going on in laos at the time and uh, this guy taught me tradecraft you know he was kind of my uh muse and and uh gave me a lot of guidance but uh, through official channels i was providing political information to the phoenix program and i discovered something pretty upsetting and startling in that regard, because I would get their after action reports. Um, and I saw some bulletins from inside the organization that they had been penetrated by the communists. No surprise. But it was pretty startling at, at that time because I thought it might, you know, implicate me and my safety. So, um, so we, I worked closely with CIA. I got to know a number of CIA people. Uh, and that's where I first met Frank Snepp, actually. <laughs> And encountered him years later in a congressional hearing room when he did whistleblowing about CIA screw ups during the evacuation of Saigon. And so, anyway, it was a spy's life. It was really interesting. And the most, the big takeaway for me was that I got very familiar with what was called later on, uh, became known as the clandestine mentality and there really is such a thing as the clandestine mentality i suppose it's, it's, like, it's like a cop mentality or maybe even a baker's mentality you know a certain way of looking at the world um you become uh it takes a while it took me even for, with my limited experience it took me years to get used to not looking for suspicious things around me you know um and of course, then I went into journalism eventually, and there are certain interviewing techniques and so on that were applicable. Well, it I gave me a leg up, I think, in terms of reporting on intelligence, because I knew the mindset of the people I was talking to, and they respected me for my experience. Could you tell us a little bit about that transitional experience, Jeff? You finished your, your mandatory time in Vietnam, and I was reading about how you, you know, grew to have some real misgivings about the conflict in general. And um, mm. so what was it like kind of leaving Vietnam, leaving the military? And then what was how did you how and what was it like transitioning into journalism? Well, like a lot of veterans, you just want to get on with your life, you know, when you get out. Mm -hmm. And and I did. I had to go back to college and finish up, get my degree because I dropped out of college. This is why I got drafted or was going <laughs> to be drafted in the first place. You know, I was playing in a band in Martha's Vineyard, having a really good time. <laughs> you know, feckless youth. And uh, so I just, but I, I, I had that army experience. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I wasn't anywhere on the political spectrum. I just wanted to get my, I knew it was a mess. You know, I came back and said, man, that is really a mess. Um, but I just wanted to get out with life. So I went back to school, night school at, at Boston University and uh and uh ended up getting my degree but in my last year 1970 you know came the twin barrels of the invasion of cambodia which i thought was oh man that is really crazy that is that's nuts and horrible and then the pentagon papers which confirmed all my worst suspicions about mm -hmm. um what we had been doing in Vietnam, very provocative stuff in North Vietnam, really bringing the war to North Vietnam in a very subversive way. Um, and, uh, and it kind of radicalized me. Uh, and uh, so by the time I, so my politics had become swung to the left in this sort of non, you know, sort of this vague way, you know, I was against the war big time. And I, and I became good friends with another Vietnam veteran uh, at graduate in graduate school at, at Berkeley. I did China studies uh, at Berkeley, got my MA in China studies, and I became really best friends with another Vietnam veteran. No surprise. And we both felt the same that it was just this hell horrible thing that had happened and was ongoing in Vietnam. The level of destruction uh, was just horrible. So I that was my politics and the war. It's a crime. Um, get it over with. So I, I, I 
became a little bit of an activist, uh, not much, but that was where my head was at. And then this was also the Watergate era. Watergate had also, you know, burst on the scene. And and I can't believe looking back that no one really believed that the Republic, that the White House wasn't involved in that. I mean, really, you know, people don't realize that if the, all of journalism were, did not jump on the Washington Post, Bob Woodward, um, Carl Bernstein exposures back then. They, they, a lot of people wouldn't believe the Washington Post report. And I'm looking at that. I, I remember I, I had a waiter's job. Now, that summer that that story broke um, at a Boston, at a, it's the Ritz Hotel in Boston before I went out to Berkeley. And I'm reading about that in the Boston Globe. You know, these Cubans and former CIA people caught red-handed with a whole bunch of cash in, in the Democratic Party's headquarters at the Watergate. And, you know, the, the Woodward, who had been an, a Navy intelligence officer, he kicked up on it. He knew what was going on right away. And his partner, Carl Bernstein, was a naturally suspicious person anyway. So they they all immediately sensed what this was, was a covert political operation. But most of the press did not believe the Washington Post and, and, and thought the Post was just being sensational, sensationalistic. Um, uh, it, it went on for another year or more before the rest of the press started saying, "Hey, there's really something, something to this." So, uh, so here we have this domestic spying stuff going on. The Vietnam War is going on, and I thought, well, I I know a lot about this stuff, so I can write some stuff about this. I'll, I'll write. So I was a pretty good writer, and so I. I wrote a piece of, about uh, stay behind what, the, what U.S. intelligence was doing in Vietnam, uh, creating stay behind operations, uh, which I think turned out in the end to be very unsuccessful. Uh, but uh, this, the, agents, the CIA and the rest of the U.S. intelligence was doing this and this and this. And I wrote it for a little liberal uh, news service, but a lot of newspapers picked it up and put it on the front page. And I thought, well, I kind of like this, you know. I, I thought I might end up as a high school teacher or, you know, prep school teacher or something. And, but I kind of like this. I, I, I'm sure I just like seeing my name in the lights. And I had written something that nobody knew about or very few. And so, uh, that, that started me on my path. And I headed to Washington. Uh, uh <laughs> Washington Post did not hire me, uh, <laughs> with my zero experience. What a shock. But I got my first uh, experience working for a suburban weekly paper in Northern Virginia, covering the county supervisors uh, and the business of the county. I learned uh, how de developers act like CIA when they're doing it, secretly buying up plots of land, you know, uh, and so to get around environmental restrictions and so on, and then springing it on the public. So then I went into radio for a while. I worked at the very early uh, NPR, all things considered, when you had to tell people what it was when you called up. Um, and then for a weekly and this and that. Anyway, I, I, then, I eventually ended up, I, I was stringing for the Christian Science Monitor and uh, stringing for NPR covering foreign policy and national security issues. And eventually I got on uh, with UPI. Uh, and I was dep became deputy foreign editor at UPI when it was still really a real news service. Uh, but it was really financially wobbling after my four or five years there. And so I got a book contract to do this book about this Green Beret case in Vietnam. Un un which un became, un yeah, I'm going to do a plug here. <laughs> un unwrap that for us, Jeff. I, I, uh, I mean, I think most special forces guys are, at least have some familiarity with this story. It was a big deal at the time. T tell us what, about yeah. it, uh, uh, what happened and what your investigation revealed. Well, I was in Vietnam at the time that the, that the story broke that uh, the commander of 5th Special Forces and seven of his men, his top aides, have been arrested and charged with first-degree murder in the connection with the disappearance of a Vietnamese national. That was the bare-bones story. 
did I remember, you know, I'm a case officer over there, and I remember reacting saying, wow, they're going to arrest people for murder, for, you know, getting rid of one Vietnamese uh, suspected double agent. Wow. I mean, we're napalming villages every day, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, anyway, I was always curious about that. Uh, and, and then I saw this uh, Australian movie called, uh, you know, a dramatic movie called Breaker Morant. And it takes yeah. place in South Africa during the Boer War, at the early uh, 20th century, in which these Australian special forces conscripts um, are uh, uh, kind of ordered to kill, a, to get rid of a, of a German spy and they do it uh, and the Germans go absolutely nuts about it and they demand that the British try these guys for murder or they're going to come in full force in the war and so these guys are tried and they're and they're executed and I walked out of the theater thinking boy I know a Vietnam version of that story um, so I got talking about it to a to a literary agent in D.C. who I was very friendly with, and she said, boy, that's a book. you got to write a book about that. I hadn't even written a major magazine piece at, piece at that time, so I, didn't, I couldn't imagine writing a book, but eventually years went by, and she kept bugging me about it, and I, by that time I had written some major magazine stories, and I felt confident I could write a book, so I tracked down a number of the key participants enough to write a book proposal, and I got a contract, to write the book um and uh, it came out it didn't sell very well uh but it got some great reviews uh one reviewer in the chicago uh tribune called it better than watergate uh because there was murder involved and conspiracies within conspiracies uh i thought um as we were talking before the show, Jack, I thought the Special Forces Association would really embrace this book because it was the, really the true story of what had happened. But they hated it because in their version of events, the Special Forces commander had been uh, uh, persecuted by the army uh, because the army, the commander of the army in Vietnam, General Abrams, an old tanker, uh, hated the special forces, which I don't believe is true. And none, none of the evidence I dug up showed that he hated the special forces, but he, he hated the idea that they thought they were independent from the chain of command. But the real blow came when General Abrams called down the commander of the Green Beret. So what had happened is that the, they, they suspected this Vietnamese spy for them was a double agent. So they brought him in and interrogated him, and they interrogated the shit out of him for 10 days. He never confessed. They used drugs on him. Uh, but they decided, well, if he wasn't a communist when he came in, he's a communist now. Um, so they... They took him on a boat, shot him in the head, and dumped him overboard with weights, the tire rims, and chains. But his widow showed up, and his wife showed up and says, where's my husband? I suspect something bad happened. She wasn't any peasant. These were middle-class Vietnamese people. Uh, she was educated, and she said, where's my husband? And when she, they gave her answers that weren't persuasive to her. She went right to the U.S. Embassy and started banging on doors. And it eventually rattled up the chain of command of General Abrams, and he called in the commander of the Special Forces, Colonel Robert Rowe, R-H-E-A-U-L-T, command, and said, what, what's going on up there? What's going on with this, this Vietnamese? And he said, oh, we sent him on a mission. He's just been out of contact. And soon as soon as the Rowe walked out of his uh, office, he said, that son of a bitch is lying to me. Um, and he told his aide to order the CID, criminal army detectives to go and clean that place out and they went in and the whole middle third of my book is like a police procedural with army detectives investigating the green berets and the green berets trying to cover up what happened um they weren't all that smart they had requisitioned the boat the motor the tire rims the chains and uh, the silencer for the pistol i mean they signed chips <laughs> <laughs> So the, I, tracked down, I tracked down the detectives who worked on the case, and they told me the whole story. I interviewed everyone involved in that case, except for Nixon and Kissinger. And they played a big role. 
I hate to do the spoiler here, but Nixon made the case go away because the head of the CIA, Richard Helms, came to him and said, we can't have this case go to trial because the lawyers for the defendants know all about the Phoenix program, the assassination program, and they're going to bring that up if we go to trial. So you can't have that happen. So Nixon shut down uh, the prosecution. But these guys were up for first degree murder. Um, And uh, so it was really quite a cause celeb. Uh, in 1969, it was front page news. Uh, Congress got on the side of all the defendants and saying they were being screwed. But the real, here's the contemporary angle for this story. I'm sure I probably, half the people listening probably turned it off by now. Um, and and uh, the issue is that the lawyer for one of the Green Beret defendants arrived in Saigon and he was met by a big gaggle of the press who had heard about him coming over. And he, they say, so what happened? What's going on here? And he says, in his thick South Carolina accent, he said, now I'm not going to stipulate that my client did anything wrong, much less a murder. But if these boys did kill these, kill this suspected Viet Cong, shouldn't they be getting medals? I mean, why are they in jail? I mean, we're, we're not here to capture cities. Or, you know, uh, or even mountaintops. We don't even hold on to mountaintops. We're not here capturing cities or territory. We're here to kill communists. And that's what they may have done. <coughs> Boy, does that sound familiar? Yep. <laughs> we're, here, we're here to kill jihadis. We're not here to capture cities. We're here to kill uh, AQ. We're here to kill ISIS. It became a war of murder. Uh why? Or assassinations, how, whatever you want to call it, and that's what we've been involved in for the last twenty years. Yeah, why? Why are you prosecuting our heroes? Uh, we, I mean, we went through all of that just the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going uh, to for uh, twenty years. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm when you mention this story, I'm thinking specifically about the Eddie Gallagher case, where that narrative really came to the forefront. I think. Perfect. Um, yep. I, exactly. I, I, uh, Jeff, just one moment. I got to give a quick shout out here to uh, the sponsors for the show. Uh, our first sponsor for the show is uh, PIA VPN. It's a uh, private internet access. They provide a VPN service for all you spooky folks out there who want to uh, anonymize <laughs> your internet traffic. If you, you, you know, spoiler alert, if you just hit you know private, you know open a private window on your browser that does not anonymize your internet traffic. Your internet service provider still knows that you're looking at Pornhub or whatever the hell you people do, uh, you know, in the privacy of your own home. So <laughs> VPN uh, services like uh, PIA, protect, um, you know, private internet access, anonym- completely anonymizes your internet traffic. Um, it can be here in the United States or it could be when you're traveling abroad in some not so friendly parts of the, of the world and you want a VPN service. Um, so... Uh, Go to PIAVPN.com slash TeamHouse. That's PIAVPN.com slash TeamHouse. And you will get 83% off your first order. Uh, and, um, yeah, I think that's uh, it for this. So, yeah, 83% off your first order. So I hope you guys will go and check them out. And then the second uh, sponsor for the show... Uh, yeah, is uh, AG1 uh, by a- uh, by Athletic Greens. Um, so it's a great product. I, I've been taking it every morning. And, you know, it, it um, it's – so the things that, that they uh, want me to make sure I say, so I get those. So um, why well, take it every morning? It's a, it's a great habit to get into. It um, makes it easier for you to take the highest quality supplements. Um, it's one scoop of powder. It tastes good. Uh, it, it tastes great, actually. Um, and uh, let's see here. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm just going to talk. Like, getting getting some good nutritional products is very important in your life, especially for somebody like me as you're getting older, as you got the arthritis. Even uh, for, for you guys, it uh, it helps supplement uh, your uh, immunity system, Gut your health. immune system. Like uh, Multivitamin. Yeah, the multivitamins. It, it's a great product. Check them out. Um uh, it's uh, right here. Yeah, Athletic they're giving Greens. you one com. free uh, year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first per- first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com uh, backslash or the team health 
Uh, that's athleticgreens.com slash the team outs. It's a good product. I, we, I recommend it. And everybody should get a VPN. Uh, you shouldn't be on a public network in Starbucks, in an airport, in a hotel without a VPN. So yeah, we're, or we're in Iran or China. Yeah, we're in Iran exactly. or China. We're we're not asking what you're looking at. We're just saying that you might want a VPN. <laughs> so, Jeff, um, back back to you here. Um, I I actually I need to order a copy of the book. You and I have had a conversations about it before, and I, I've encountered this story. Um, but you really investigated it. What? Give us the title for the folks out there listening. They can go find it on Amazon. It's called A Murder in Wartime. By Jeff Stein. A lot of used copies, very cheap. <laughs> and paperbacks. And uh, as time went on, I mean, you worked for a lot of different places. You worked for Newsweek, Washington Post. Um, tell us a little bit about Spy Talk. Like, how, where did that first evolve from? Where did that come out of? Oh, okay. That's, that's fun to talk about. I, I was the Homeland Security Editor at Congressional Quarterly. Which is no longer hasn't been a quarterly for many years. It uh, it does a whole variety of reports on what Congress is up to, uh, right down to a very granular level. They had the foresight in early 2002 to start a daily covering Homeland Security. That was all new, you know. I mean, the 911 attacks is late, you know, September 2001, and so the very smart editor in chief of congressional quarterly said we ought to we ought to be covering homeland security on a daily basis there's probably some good business in that for us it was a paid uh, newsletter so i had about uh seven reporters and uh, and, uh sub editors and we started this thing and it went like gang fire it just really caught on and it was doing really well but it didn't the subject area didn't interest me at all that much it was you know a lot of you know domestic uh, bureaucratic issues of, you know, setting up the Department of Homeland Security and, you know, hustling all these various agencies in, under one roof, which was going disastrously. And still some people will tell you that DHS is still a big mistake. Um, but in any event, I was covering that. And, you know, my real territory was national security, foreign policy, military and so just out of boredom, I start and, and, you know, sources were still coming to me and telling me things. And I was, of course, keeping up on the news in those areas. And so I started a day, uh, a weekly column called Spy Talk. Um, and that caught on. And, uh, and then, uh, it got popular enough that we started doing it daily, you know, and people were paying for it. So then, uh, the economist group bought CQ. And there were massive layoffs. There were 45 of us laid off in one day, me being among them. Um, but a few months later, the Washington Post uh, hired me to continue it as a daily blog at, at the Washington Post. Um, so I did that for a year or so. It didn't, it didn't work out all that well because they wanted kind of instant analysis on major developments in the intelligence world where I tended to do more investigative stuff and real insider <coughs> bits and pieces of information. And, um, uh, so it was, it was, it was, it was a, 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 a medium, immediately, immediately successful. Um, but I didn't like doing that kind of thing every day, a daily blog. Anyway, some people are good at instant wisdom, but I'm not. Um, so anyway, meantime, a friend of mine or a guy I knew had become editor uh, of the resurrected uh, Newsweek. And he called me up and said, hey, uh, you want to come work for us? And I said, sure. Uh, so he hired me to uh, do investigative reporting and to do spy talk. So I started there, and that ran for six years, and then new ownership, more new management took over Newsweek. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> – so that was like the, going through the UPI experience again where the owner just stopped paying his bills and so on. So um, so anyway, I did that, and then, uh, again, fortuitously, just as we were lopped off at Newsweek um, – the last of us real reporters were lopped off. Um, um, Substack came along, and a friend of mine was one of the first people they signed up. Uh, signed up Bill Bishop, who does a China daily uh, for Substack, and it was an instant success. And he's making a lot of money. I'm very happy for him. Um, 
And he said they, the Substack would love having spy talk. <coughs> so uh, I was talking about it with a bunch of my friends over drinks, you know, uh, fellow long in the tooth national security reporters who were, were semi retired, not ready to quit. And it was sort of like doing a play at, at summer camp. You know, you do the scenery and I'll do the music, you know. Um, so we all came together and we said, well, let's do this. So we did and started. And uh, the first story was on August 31st, uh, 2020. And um, it got good play. It was about Ron, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin and his odd connections with the Russians. And it was done by Peter Eisner, a former deputy editor, uh, 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 deputy foreign editor of the Washington Post, former editor at News, uh, Newsday and an AP reporter. And I had all these other guys with sterling uh, credentials who had worked for elite publications and, and had very distinctive uh, 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 careers of great distinction. And so... We put out that story, and then it was like, "Holy shit, we got to do another story." <laughs> you know? I, uh, people I, were suddenly I, signing up. I definitely enjoy seeing some of the uh, some people that either I've read their work or I've met them over the years, and see them pop up on Spy Talk. Uh, John Dingus, uh, who's a, yeah. was a was a professor at Columbia. Um, I, I met with him once in his office hours to talk about his book. Uh, and really? Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, one of my and, best friends. And then um, we talked about him earlier, uh, Matthew Brazil, uh, who writes about Chinese espionage. Uh, who, who are some of the other uh, interesting folks you have writing at Spy Talk? Well, uh, like I mentioned, Peter Eisner, uh, the former deputy foreign editor at the Post. Uh, um, um, <laughs> I pulled up a blank. All of a sudden. Well, recently we had Frank Snepp, uh, former. Uh, CIA officer who wrote that uh, groundbreaking expose about the last days of Saigon. Uh, he's been uh, uh, writing for me. Um, and uh, let me let me look. I don't want to leave anybody out. I so I want to name some of the principals. Yeah, like you say, Peter Eisner. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, John Dingus is a former managing editor of news at NPR, as you might know, and has written three extraordinarily important books on Latin America and yeah. and the Killing Machine that came out of Chile, uh, Operation Condor. James Grady. Uh, another contributing editor, he, you know, he wrote the original Six Days of the Condor. Oh, really? Which became Three Days of the Condor for the movie. Um, uh, Olga Lautman, who's a, who's an expert on, on Russia. I know, uh, I know Olga. She's terrific. Elaine Monahan, who was a distinguished Reuters correspondent and bureau chief in Moscow and, in Kiev years ago, by the way. Um, uh, Gus Russo, who's written nine books on on uh, organized crime and intelligence stuff, JFK assassination. Um, uh, Elaine Shannon, who uh, was a star correspondent at Newsweek and Time at various times, uh, writing about the drug war. Uh, the queen of drugs and thugs is what I call her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, it, it's, uh, oh, I forgot. Jonathan Broder, who, who was a, uh, a Chicago Tribune and AP reporter in the Middle East for many years. Um, uh, who also worked for Congressional Quarterly as a foreign editor, uh, worked for Newsweek as a court foreign policy correspondent. Uh, he writes on the Middle East for me quite often. Um, Let's see who else I'm spinning down. Uh, and then occasional contributors who aren't really, you know, journalists so much like David Charney, who's a, a Washington psychiatrist who has a large clientele of uh, intelligence people and who has been authorized to do interviews with uh, moles, you know, um, guys who are spying for the Russians and who were caught. And he's done extensive prison interviews with those people. Um Adam Zagrin, a longtime former uh, Time Magazine correspondent. Mark Stout, former CIA historian. Gail Helt, former CIA oh, analyst on East Asia. She's been on the show before. <laughs> she's fabulous. Yeah. Jim Laurie, former uh, longtime corresp ABC correspondent in Southeast Asia. Um, it goes on and on and on. Uh, Craig Unger, who's written for us, uh, wrote a book about Trump and the Russians. Um, 
Ayako Doi, who uh, was a Japan cor- uh, uh, a U.S. correspondent for the Japan Daily for many years. She's writing a piece for me now about what's going on in Japan and their military services. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, it's it's been a great, uh, I, it's just a great crew. And everybody, you know, there are, there are no employees. Uh, it's just people contribute when they can. And that's great. And they bring, you know, the only rule is, you know, be interesting and bring something new to the table. Tell our readers something they don't know or they probably don't know. or uh, Let them see stuff uh, through another looking glass. So that's the idea. We're kind of special forces, hit and run, you know. We sneak <laughs> in in the night, boom, yeah. and then we're gone. I-, I would like to ask you about some of your own rabble-rousing. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us about the uh, Jane Harmon uh, APAC story that you broke. Wow. Well, that was really something. That was way back, uh, almost probably 15, uh, no, it was 2009, I guess. So it was, what, 13 years ago? Let's see if I can remember. Anyway, the basic story was it was this, this case going on where the Justice Department was prosecuting two officials of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and that's essentially a lobbying arm for Israel. And they, pro- they were being prosecuted as unregistered. I think the, the charge was that they were unregistered foreign agents. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was a lot of things wrong with that prosecution, I think. But anyway, I think the administration wanted to make a point that we're, we're, we're tired of this sort of essentially lobbying by these people and they're not registering as foreign agents. Uh, and... Uh, and, and so, um, uh, and, and an Israeli agent, uh, agent of influence, very, I couldn't name him because I couldn't absolutely confirm, corroborate from multiple sources that he was an Israeli agent of influence, very big uh, Hollywood figure, uh, a figure who was big in Hollywood, big, very influential, that he uh, called Jane Harmon, said, uh, look, uh, I'll tell you what, if you'll, you'll, you know, you're friendly with the Bush White House, uh, uh, they like you, even though you're a Democrat. Uh, if you'll intervene and, and persuade them to drop these charges against the APAC guys, I'll, uh, tell Nancy Pelosi to make you chairman of the Intelligence Committee, which was something that Jane Harmon, uh, had really been yearning for. Um, so how did I know this? Because uh, I was leaked a transcript of an NSA intercept that was on to this Israeli agent, and they picked up this conversation. And my sources, who had long been pissed off about this uh, extensive Israeli uh, influence operation in Washington and elsewhere, they leaked it to me, and uh, and so I wrote the story about that. Um and it caused a big, big hullabaloo. Um, it was picked up by the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal, who all very generously gave me uh, direct credit for the piece. <laughs> We're breaking the story. And the reason they moved it so fast is because they knew it was true, because they had done their own investigations. Jane Harmon went nuts, you know, went on TV saying, you know, uh, this isn't true, and how dare the NSA spy on me? Of course, they she knew damn well they weren't spying on her. The NSA would be crucified if it did that. They were spying on the Israeli agent, and they, right. she got caught up in it. And then I wrote a follow-up story that's just really too complicated to explain here about other um, other machinations in that uh, conspiracy to get these charges dropped, and that got another round of conspiracy uh, stories and headlines. Anyway, but I was reminded when I was telling you about that story, uh, I I had been uh, become quite astounded at the ignorance on the intelligence communities about basic facts of what we were doing in Iran and Afghanistan. And uh, and I'd read a transcript of uh, an investiga- a congressional investigation where FBI officials were quizzed about what they knew about uh, uh, Al Qaeda uh, uh, and, and the Iranians and so on. And they showed that, and they essentially said that the head of counterintelligence actually told his committee it didn't matter if he knew anything about them. Criminals are criminals, and we know how to go after them. Um, so I put this all together, and I was talking to a. a 
I was sharing that with a friend who was then running the op-ed page of the New York Times, and he said, well, put it all together for us in a in an op-ed piece, will you? So I did, and they ran it with, and they gave it huge space, and the headline was, Can You Tell a Sunni from a Shiite? Uh, and uh, it was very embarrassing to a number of these members of Congress and on the Intelligence Committee and, and the FBI, you know, and how little they knew about the enemy we were spending money and and lives on uh, going after in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that got a lot of attention, a lot of attention, because people it was essentially writing a story that everybody knew was true, but nobody had written it, which is kind of the best kind of story to do. Uh-huh. People, you know, you somebody say, yes, I'm so glad somebody finally wrote that story, you know. Um, but it, only a couple of months after that, um in the elections of november uh uh 2008 i guess uh the democrats took retook uh control of congress and and uh a congressman from el paso uh became chairman uh with the designated incoming chairman of the house intelligence committee and so and i was working for congressional quarter we often you know call up members of congress and ask them what their position was on this and that real uh granular kind of stuff um so i called him up and asked for an interview and he said because we're congressional quarterly and widely read on the hill uh closely read on the hill he said sure so i went and interviewed him and uh, i asked him are you in favor of the troop surge in iraq and he said, definitely, definitely am. I said, well, what, what do you want it to accomplish? He said, I, I want him to go out there and kill people who are killing the Americans. And I said, well, which people are you talking about? Are you talking about Iran-backed militias? Are you talking about Al-Qaeda? Are you talking about double agents in the interior ministry? <laughs> Any number of suspects who were killing Americans. Um, and he said, whoever. <laughs> and I asked him, let me ask you about Al Qaeda. Said, are they Sunni or Shia? Now, this again, only a couple of months after this huge piece I had written for the New York Times, or a piece that had gotten huge circulation. I said, what, "What's Al Qaeda? Are they Sunni or Shia?" He said, uh, "Hmm." He said, uh, "Shia." <laughs> Wrong. You know, Al Qaeda is Sunni. They're fundamentally Sunni. They're very, very Sunni. <laughs> And uh, so I wrote that up, and uh, that got a huge amount of attention, <laughs> and that's because just of what he said. Of course, people like Fox News, they love that. They had me on around the clock virtually because, you know, it was a Democrat. Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> so, and, and same with the, the Jane Harmon story, by the way. Uh, Fox had me on all their shows uh, and uh, uh, because it was a Democrat. Uh, that I was maligning. Uh, and, uh, you know, F- Fox and Friends was kind of new back then. That's the uh, early morning show. I guess everybody knows that. Anyway, I was in the, the you know, the prep room, the makeup room, and, I, and it was like 5.30 in the morning, and I said, who's watching television at you know, this ungodly hour? And they said, the White House. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was during the Bush administration. So anyway, um, oh, so those just a couple of the stories I've I've gotten a kind of a kick out of doing. Uh, I'm often said to be in the tank for the Democrats. Uh, uh, I can assure anyone who comes to my site that that is not the case. Um, I have uh, criticized. Uh, uh obama quite a bit I, we have criticized biden we ran a piece of eviscerating the biden white house on the last days of kabul uh we reported information that had not been reported before on how bollocked up that evacuation was more i mean we know it was bollocked up but more bollocked up than had been known um so uh you know we don't care about uh i mean we are for uh, loyalty and patriotism. Right. <laughs> We're not on the side of people who want to overthrow the government, you know, invade the Capitol, kill cops, uh, try to kidnap governors, uh, suspend the Constitution, 
uh, we're not for that because we're, they're not they're not loyal Americans. So we're against that bullshit, uh, dangerous bullshit, I must say. Um, they are not to be uh, minimized. Uh, so we're against that. Uh, uh, we're for patriotism and we're for you know the American way. <laughs> Truth God in the American way. Jeff, can I? And, uh, but whoever's in the White House, we're going to uh, look at them very closely. Can I ask you about your journey? Because, you know, you, you, you did your time in Vietnam as an intel officer in the Army. And you left, is it fair to say that you left kind of jaded that, that, that you, you, you said you went kind of left, that you were anti war? And, well, anti that war. Anti that not war. Not anti war. Right, right. Fair enough. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and then you started working as a journalist, and then you sort of got pulled back into this world of espionage in, in the sense of, um, you know, writing about espionage, but also also hosting a lot of people who had been in that community. So obviously, you didn't have a hate, or you didn't have, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't like, oh, uh, like anti espionage and anti-war in general and no, anti-national no. defense how how did that journey was was there a cooling off period for you after vietnam um i was never anti-war like you say in terms of all war i thought world war ii was a just war <clears throat> korea fighting back again i mean there was some really stupid things the u.s did in korea <laughs> which encouraged the, the north korean invasion but um and the Chinese invasion, I should say. Um, uh, but no, I'm I'm against stupid. I'm I'm against stupidity, right. uh, unnecessary war. I, I was totally against the invasion of Iraq. I uh, and I had written a book with a former Saddam uh, a scientist in the nuclear program, uh, Saddam's bomb maker. Um, uh, I was uh, you know I knew that, that Saddam Hussein was a very evil, evil person. Um, but I thought invading Iraq would be about the stupidest thing we could do. Uh, so I was against that. Uh, uh, the getting rid of, you know, going into Afghanistan to get rid of uh, uh, Al Qaeda. I was all for that. I held my breath, but I was I was for it. I was I, I thought it was a horrible irony that Republicans who had campaigned of, against nation building suddenly decided to become nation builders in, in Afghanistan. And I thought, man, this is Vietnam all over again. Right. Or Iraq all over again. Uh, I mean, I mean, this is, this is going to be a horrible thing. This we're, this we're not good at this counterinsurgency thing. Our guys don't fight as well as their guys, you know, because they're fighting for something. As the Russians are finding out in Ukraine, I'm, I am a hardliner on Putin, by the way. I am. Uh, you can't get, you can hardly get to the right of me on on supporting the Ukrainians to um, throw out the Russians. Uh, I'm very worried about where this is going and how it's going to end, but I'm a hardliner on that. So no, I'm not anti-war. I was against these w stupid wars. Right, right. Um, but uh, it, it, it was a transition to go through. You're right. Uh, 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 and I, so I, I think also it's just getting older and hopefully wiser, uh, knowing the new, getting to know the news business more and more, learning how to temper my instincts and uh, emotions. Uh, Has there uh, been? I mean, you had to leave. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had to leave those at the door as a wire service. That's for sure at UPI. You know. Has there has there been anybody uh, that you've come across in your? Uh, uh, and I'm sure there have been a number of people, but was was there anybody who really sort of educated you to the to the overall intelligence apparatus at at any point in time? Anybody was there ever anybody who uh, maybe changed your opinion, or if not changed it, expanded it, or anything like that? Well, I'd say I, I I wouldn't put it that way because I you know being trained as a case officer you one of the basic orientations you get right. is right. what the intelligence community is and although nobody used that term back then that I remember uh, and uh, so I I got to know I mean it was a real eye opener to learn all the clandestine activities that we were involved with um, and back in the sixties. 
uh, and you you never unlearn that. Um, but I would say that there were certain uh, intelligence officials who enlightened me further. Um, I remember one revealing conversation. It kind of jolted me at the time. I was sitting with a um, an ex. Uh, senior CIA operations officer who had quit because he just got tired of bad stuff that was going on in the 60s. And um, we were having lunch in downtown Washington, and and it was just not long after uh, the mullahs, uh, the, uh, Khamenei, took power in Iran, the Iranian uh, Islamic Revolution, and I was railing on about, sputtering on about what, you know, how stupid it was to overthrow the Shah and then put these, put and back the Shah through thick and thin. And look what happened now, the Islamic revolution. And he kind of gave me a droll smile and he said, Hey, we got 25 years out of the Shah. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> yeah. And I said, Oh, that's how, that's the way they look at it. You know, okay. You know, um, I mean, I remember that just really striking me as a kind of somewhere between stoicism and cynicism. Yeah. Uh, but it further educated me on the core of clandestine mindset. And then there was a whistleblower uh, uh, who had been a very senior guy at CIA, Victor Marchetti, who came in, who uh, co uh, w teamed up with a, a former State Department intelligence officer by the name of John Marks, and they wrote a book called the CIA and the cult of intelligence. And it was a real mind blower. And it, it had a lot of exposés about stuff. Um, uh, but it's really where where Victor in personal meaning in the book, and then I got to be very friendly with him. He really clarified my thing about how this clandestine mentality that only we can solve this problem through our covert means and let's overthrow this guy and kill that guy and so on it, it sort of takes over you know uh, and there weren't it wasn't a cooler head around as someone to sort of parachute and say which should be the president actually to say this is not a good idea and we shouldn't be doing this and i don't mean to be as richard helm says we uh, a, a famous you know ex-cia director he said we're not boy scouts and we shouldn't be confused with that well you don't want to CIA to be Boy Scouts, but you want them to be smart, smarter and shrewder than they often have proven to be. Um, and I think we're they're going to be really tested now with the challenges of Russia, China, and Iran, mm -hmm. and North Korea. So they got to they got to do the smart thing. Of course, in the end, it's the president who makes the final decision on covert action. Um, we got to do a better job. Again, see, I'm not anti-CIA. I want them to do a better job of spying. Uh, we want to know what our adversaries are up to. Uh, they're spying on us, and they're doing a pretty good job. If you if you consider that every arrest of uh, an, an agent of China, Russia, or Iran here means that you that there are ninety percent more of them. You know, yeah. you arrest one. That means they're, it's like catching a rat or a mouse. You know, there's a whole bunch more behind the wall. Yeah. So um, we got to do more on counterintelligence, and we, uh, which conflicts with you know uh, uh, freedom of speech and all that stuff. Uh, we got, but we got to definitely do better uh, uh, in spying on China, Russia, and and Iran and North Korea. And I don't think we're getting anything out of North Korea. I think. We're too dependent on one NSA, electronic intercepts, mm -hmm. and, and, and various varieties of the kind of things the NSA does, as the Air Force does, the satellites do, mm -hmm. and so on. But there's no, there's no substitute for having an agent in the inside circles of power, you know? Yeah. I mean, the famous Russian spy, a Russian who spy for us, Penkovsky, told us, you know, tipped us off to the Russian missiles in Cuba. Uh, and there's just no, no substitute for espionage, really good espionage. What? So we got to do better at that. We we may be doing better than I think. I hope so. Yeah. 
What a, you know, you, you mentioned that you guys have eviscerated politicians on both the left and the right. What do you think our politicians need to do better? What are the same, what are mm-hmm. the mistakes you see them making over and over again? Well, I think we're, we're really in an extraordinary era now that's sort of like the 1850s, um, where the country is on the verge of some kind of civil war. I mean, it's not like we're going to have, you know, armies and cannons, you know, firing at each other, you know, uh, rampaging through Virginia or Tennessee or Georgia, but it's, it's playing out in social, uh, warfare, um, I think, you know, you're going to have to do something about these seditionists who are holding office in Congress. Uh, unfortunately, it takes like two thirds of a vote in Congress to expel somebody. But we essentially have Confederates, at least 20 in, in, the, in, the, in the House of Representatives and, and, and a handful more, maybe as, uh, a dozen in, in the Senate who are trying to bring down the government. I mean, what do you do about that? Uh, I mean, the Germans just uncovered a very ambitious and startling coup uh, um, uh, uh, conspiracy to bring down the German government. Uh, we have learned through hearings and, and media investigations that we were a lot closer to losing our government on January 6th than we thought at the time. I mean, the conspiracy was deep. Uh, and they were close to getting these uh, alternate electors in. They, uh, I, 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 you know, they wanted to bring uh, Trump and his inner circle wanted to essentially destroy the U.S. Constitution. And as badly run, as sloppy as our democracy is, there's there's nothing around that we know of any better, right? Uh, we found out that the communist form of government no good. <laughs> leads to excesses. Um, fascism uh, leads to a bad place. So we're stuck with capitalist democracy as the next best thing, as the best thing we got going. And we just need to uh, really work hard to save it. Uh, I'm very, very worried about what's coming down the pike. Jeff, what did you make of this, uh, the German coup plot that's really just kind of come to light over the last week that it seems to be organized around a, uh, a, a German noble, a, a, a noble family um, that they wanted to re- sort of reinstall him. And it, it sort of brings to light a lot of things that I mean, well, it's been going on in Germany since the 1930s that there's this sort of like agrarian nostalgia, a desire to return to monarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that brings about with it, you know, the purity of the race and all of these sorts of ideas as well. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, what, what was um, your thoughts or if you have any information that, you know, Spy Talk published about, you know, the, the, this attempted coup? Because the, the German authorities did arrest like 100 people in this last week. Yeah, I, I think the guy who he was a, sort of the titular head or he's sort of the figurehead, this guy who claimed the aristocratic bloodline he's kind of a figure of what's worrisome to me is how de- deeply uh, uh penetrated the, the uh, special force german special forces units are their delta force the ksk so yeah they're deeply infiltrated by these right wingers uh ultra right wingers who who want to bring down the government um you know, I ran a story, I, I dug up a story uh, last year about how the Intel link chat rooms were full of hate speech. Intel link, for people who don't know, that's a classified communication system that the intelligence agencies use. And it goes from very low level confidential all the way up to top secret uh, compartmented. Uh, American uh, I mean, intelligence have a, services. American intelligence yeah. service. They have to have a way. People have to have a way, have a way to communicate. You know, uh, an agent in, uh, in in Tanzania has to be able to c- communicate with headquarters. You know, or his station chief, uh, or her station chief. Uh, so, you know, there's Intel Link. It's like a classified email system, um, and they have discussion rooms and so on. So this one level, of, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more than confidential, classified. They have chat rooms for people to just trade ideas and thoughts. Well, it, it, it just became full of hate speech and pro-Trump 
sympathies even after January 6th. And uh, the guy who ran it shared some of the content with me. It was really startling. And I've been hearing from other sources over the previous year that that uh, people in special forces units or or the the special forces uh, people who work with the CIA's ground branch um, uh, paramilitaries uh, they were more and more outspoken about their uh, anti-government sympathies or pro-Trump sympathies. And again, it's not just being pro-Republican here. It's being pro a guy who wants to destroy our Constitution. Well, so, it's, uh, I, that, I mean, I've, alarming. I, I've, <laughs> got, I've gotten some hate myself for writing about and, and talking about. I mean, there are QAnon people in the special operations community, in the FBI, and in the CIA. Um, they, they, I'm not saying mm -hmm. they're in large numbers. I don't believe they are at all. Um, but right, these right. people, these people do exist. Yeah, they shouldn't exist at all. I mean, when I signed up uh, for the army and intelligence, I had to fill out, you know, check off this form that listed about fifty organizations. <laughs> did, was I a member of them, or had I ever do? I, did I have friends in them? Had I done any business with them? And. Uh, uh, you know, you just weren't allowed to have, uh, you weren't allowed to, to traffic with anti-constitutional uh, organizations. And um, I don't know where we are. I mean, we got members of Congress and, and the Senate who are anti-constitutionalists. I mean, what else, what else do you say about them if they're favoring the, if they're still in the in the uh, embrace? of the uh, the guy who wants who wants who said just the other day he thinks the constitution should be suspended so he could stay in office trump he wants to come back and find a way to suspend the u.s constitution um so who are these people they are disloyal americans as far as i'm concerned and so you, it's not surprising that you have them in the most boldly aggressive patriotic organizations like special forces group my uh these guys are my aggressive uh, my my team sergeant when i was in fifth group was convicted this week uh just a few days ago uh he was he was mm. at january 6th he was not charged actually with january 6th um because of threats he was making against law enforcement they raided his home in tampa florida and um, the result of that was they charged him with a lot of illegal weapons charges, and he was convicted on six, six, six of the ten charges. Um, he hasn't been sentenced yet, but I believe each of those charges carries ten years in federal prison. <laughs> he's probably flipping as fast as he can. He's flipping faster than a largemouth bass. Uh, uh, no, no. I, I think he wants to be a martyr, actually. Oh. Uh, well, see, these people in our intelligence, I, again, I think it's a very small number. And CIA seems to be located in the ground branch, you know, the paramilitary people. Um, it seems to be, uh, and they're the CIA's version of Delta. Uh, it seems to be pretty much located just in those branches. It's not very strong in the, in the um, operations branch of the clandestine services. You just have to be too broad-minded to be a good case officer especially if you're going to operate in africa or uh, in latin america or in europe you know your job is to recruit people to spy for us right and you can't be some hard right uh, uh you know closed-minded person I, I don't know i mean race N issues N ncs is like what half mil half former military at this point i mean there's a lot of republicans i'm not saying that they're bad people i'm just saying yeah. they're they're republicans I, I got you, and that's why that branch of the clandestine service has become more and more uh, Trump friendly because of the military guys who come in. I'm told it's the same uh, with the FBI, the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan who uh, have gone to Quantico, become instructors, and so on. The very outspoken against uh, liberals, against Democrats, and so on. Very militant against Democrats and liberals. And and it's not far. If you're in law enforcement and you hold those who are intelligent, it's not a, a big leap from there to embracing QAnon uh, conspiracy ideas. And and uh, 
and, and how that happens, how otherwise bright, uh, interesting people become Trump supporters, especially after January 6th, is a, a mystery to me. It has to do with cults and well, the psychology of cults. There's a, a lot of anger uh, from guys who have devoted 20 years of their life to fighting two failed wars. And as a country, we have not even come close to trying to examine uh, what the social impact of that is and what that means for us. Um, mm -hmm. We have, I mean, whether you're a, a QAnon adherent or not, or you're just, or you're a Democrat or whoever you are, I mean, you have a lot of guys out there who dedicated 20 years of their life to this conflict, and now they're all mm -hmm. having to ask themselves individually. It's like there's a gap in their existence. Like, what was that? What, what does that mean? Totally. I, I totally no, no get knows. that because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And uh, not only that, but in the 1980s, I uh, uh, ran the magazine of the Vietnam Veterans of America, Inc., mm -hmm. the service organization. And so I, you know, uh, took up again with veterans. And I know of this anger and disgust. Uh, that existed after Vietnam and for years it still does that Vietnam was a total waste of lives and money um so I know that but we didn't at that era the 1970s and 60s 70s 80s there weren't these conspiracy oh couple, yeah widespread were. conspiracy yeah, yeah, theories were, Jeff. Yeah, there were. There were, but they weren't. They did. They were not at the same volume. They're, they were not necessarily social media. They were not necessarily them. members of Congress. I'll say that much. But there were definitely a lot of left-wing yeah. conspiracies about the military industrial oh, sure. complex. I know you've heard this stuff. That's right. That's right. And I think, in fact, I have some theories about that. Is, is some people found it easy to jump from the left-wing critique. Mm -hmm. of the military industrial complex and who killed Kennedy and that stuff to move over to Trump, to the Trump side, uh, because they're really going to the same place, but just from a different direction. So I, I totally agree with you on that. I, I get that. But well, all I'm saying is that there wasn't the internet. The internet didn't exist to amplify and make ex very accessible these conspiracy theories. All you have to do is click on your computer now and you and, and you just Google something and you can get into that world, go down that rabbit hole very, very easily. Uh, and then there's, the, you know, uh, the radio shows. Talk radio is a big recruiter, too. As you probably know, a lot of AM talk radio is, you know, Trump territory. So th that only talk radio existed back then didn't have the internet to make it so you had to go seek it out to get into these uh get down these rabbit holes in the 60s and 70s i think you had to work harder to find it and now it's just right at your fingertips yeah so our, our, my uh, well for, well for my generation it's our parents they got on facebook and facebook radicalized them. <laughs> <laughs> not not my parents uh, thank god boomers. but but still um <laughs> so you recently, boomers yes yeah they're yeah my my boomer parents yeah um but no thank, thank, thank thankfully they're not they're not in the, my parents are not into that kind of stuff um but uh you recently published on uh spy talk a uh piece that i found fascinating about the final days in kabul and the kabul evacuation and it was a really startling sort of um insider account of, of what happened out there and i was wondering if you could tell us about that well the inter one of the interesting anecdotes that my writer who wrote had to write under a pen name, uh, one of the interesting anecdotes he provided is that, you know, that famous uh, C-17 airlift uh, vehicle that r rolled down the runway with people falling off the sides and out of the wheel mm -hmm. uh, wells. Um it was rushing off because there was uh, a Night Stalker's helicopter in there kitted up with all the advanced gear. And they had come in just to pick up some people with that chopper in it. And when they, and the crowd surged across the runways, uh, they said, we got to get out of Dodge. So they rolled down that, they rolled down the run, it was only one runway. Uh, they, they, they rolled down the runway and ran over people and people fell off the plane. 
but there were also the CIA's killer squads who were very active and were just mowing down people. The, the now, zero maybe units, very, the, uh, the NDS units. Yeah, yeah. Now it may be very understandable in their panic that they would just be mowing down these people, but whatever. The fact is that they did, uh, and I and we were, I think, the first to report that. Um, uh, I think there is a lot, uh, yet a lot to be reckoned with uh, on the issue of the collapse in, in Kabul. And you just know that the Republicans, uh, when they take over the House, are going to really be bearing in on that because the president is a Democrat. Uh, uh, that kind of touches on I think it was a question from Dave, you know, about where are we going? And that's where we're going. Hyper-partisanship. Um, where um, if it's a Democrat, just, just go out and destroy them. I mean, we haven't heard anything from Republicans lately about their big campaign issues was, was uh, uh, inflation, right? And the border. You, of course, you hear uh, still hear about the border because there are a number of states that are being affected directly by the surge of people coming over the border and uh, a bipartisan issue if there ever was one i mean i'm old enough to remember uh george h w bush putting forward these very earnest plans to which bipartisan plans to deal with the border issues and couldn't couldn't get it, even with a bipartisanship back then in the 1980s um and so there have been Democrats and Republicans in the White House for the last 50 years, and, and neither of them have been able to deal adequately with a border problem. Um, but you don't hear Republicans talking about that right now. You hear them talking about, you know, Hunter Biden and 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 Kabul, and we're going to reopen that investigation. That's what you hear about. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, so, I, I know they are looking at like reopening an uh, investigation. And, and I mean, honestly, maybe rightly so into the last days of our Afghanistan withdrawal. But I mean, I think I'm, that, I'm for that. I, I, I think that the 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 actually it's it's kind of a stunning silence from the American public about how disastrous the withdrawal from Afghanistan is to me really yeah. speaks to how unimportant the conflict was, how little this, it actually mattered. Well, the same happened after Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, it was over and people said, cool, glad it's over, let's move on. And that was, of course, the official uh, sentiment of every government, the, the Department of Defense and the CIA and everybody else. Is Let's, you know. Move on, yeah. Let's move along. Uh, and it's, a, it's natural, I think, that people say, most people would say, I don't want to go back and revisit that issue. Um, I can see that. I can even agree with that if you ask me, you know, an hour from now. <laughs> I mean, because uh, we have learned, unfortunately, that we don't learn. We don't have lessons learned. We have commissions and studies and so on that look at the Vietnam, starting with the Pentagon Papers, by the way, Um that look at these issues and, and iron them all out and say, we made a mistake here. We shouldn't have done this. We should have done this. We didn't do that. We, you know, we, including uh, uh, congressional hearings. There was congressional hearings on the CIA in the 1970s about all the assassinations and so on. And that led to a real reform, I think. Uh, I think it needed reform. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, how we lost the war in Afghanistan. Well, my, my erstwhile uh, colleague at the Washington Post is still a good friend, Craig uh, Whitmer. He has, he did the Afghanistan Papers book mm -hmm. and rooted out, you know, that these generals knew that they were losing and yet would say to the president and to the American people, oh, no, it's going great. One you know, more year. we've got some problems. Yeah, just need another year. And they said that forever and ever and ever. It's the same thing that happened in Vietnam. So what lessons have we learned? That what the generals have learned is to keep their job, getting promoted, getting bigger budgets, to keep saying we're winning until we're not, you know, until it's over. That's the lesson learned. That's the real lesson learned. Yeah, get that fat paycheck, that Raytheon uh, director's board appointment after the war. 
everyone goes home happy. Well, except for the kids that contractor you know, are missing heaven. Limbs. Yeah. Except for the kids are missing limbs, the family's destroyed. Um, the uh, you know the terrible destruction and tragedy left in the wake of these wars is uh, horrible, and it's not just Americans, of course, it's Afghans and Iraqis. So, um, geez, I just wish we would get smarter on some of these things. And so the, the bottom line is that the real lesson learned is by the contractors and the Defense Department and, and CIA and so on. You get bigger money, bigger budgets and so on. Um, but and the American people don't want to talk about it, generally speaking. Um, I think the Republican review of the last days of Kabul was going to be such a hatchet job. Uh, and I'm all for oversight, but I just think it'll end up as a hatchet job. Because um, these are the same people who, you know, made a big deal about Benghazi um, and put Hillary Clinton under Kleeglite for many, what, six hours, seven hours she testified. At least you came and testified. You wouldn't find Trump doing that. <laughs> I, I think there um, maybe there were some good things that came out of the Benghazi stuff as far as like f like finally DOD kind of sat down and uh, or, or, you know, the congressional committees and explained blow by blow, minute by minute what happened there. But as we spoke about there uh, underneath all of that, there's also the conspiracy that, you know, Hillary and Obama were sitting there laughing, drinking martinis while people died in Benghazi, which th I mean, that simply didn't happen. That wasn't mm. how it went mm -hmm. down. Him. Speaking of martinis, so what are you drinking there, Jack? I know it's the bottle on the table. You uh, we, have we, a cocktail. We, yeah, we drink quite a bit of scotch here on the show. Um, scotch, okay. The Belvenine was uh, a <laughs> gift from somebody. Twelve year old. <laughs> uh, so Jeff, how old is it? This is a uh, this is a fourteen year. <laughs> so it used to be the joke. How old? Is it? What time is it? <laughs> here it's uh, here it's nine. But why don't, why don't you tell us, Jeff? No, I meant uh, it used to be about liquor. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> tell us what's the uh, what's the future for Spy Talk? Can you tease anything you guys have coming up in the future? Well, um, you know, I had this uh, serious surgery uh, and a long layabout in the hospital for the rest of the summer, so it's, I'm just slowly getting up to full speed. Um, so. Uh, and when I get up to full speed, there's a number of things uh, uh, I'm going to be working on uh, that we are already starting to work on. Uh, we're looking at intelligence and covert action in regard to China, Russia, and Iran, um, and North Korea. What the options are, what's going on. Of course, we don't know everything that's going on because we're not sitting in the director's suite at CIA. Um, I'm going to take a look myself at uh, assessing um, uh, the new management at CIA. Uh, it's getting pretty good reviews to this point. Uh, everyone I've uh, queried uh, says they really like Bill Burns, that uh, he may be the best CIA director in some time. Um, they didn't get everything right on Ukraine. Uh, uh, I wrote a piece, uh, by the way, about how, you know, the intelligence, uh, they they did a lot of really great things in regard to pre-war intelligence, you know, calling out, going public about, um, uh, at least I believe their reports uh, about, uh, you know, false flag stuff the Russians were planning and so on. But what, one thing they got really wrong was that they expected the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians to pretty much fold when they came across the border from Belarus, you know, when they invaded. Uh, and I did a piece about that, uh, about, you know, uh, based on a lengthy interview I did with a former general who, you know, army general, very smart guy who, of course, named it suddenly I've gone out of my head. But one of the things he's, uh, through the exchange programs, military exchange programs of the 1990s, he was astonished to learn that, that the, that the Russian army, the remnants of the great heralded Red Army, didn't have uh, functional NCOs. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, yeah, our army runs on NCOs. Can't have an army run without NCOs. Um, 
in the Russian army, pretty much as uh, officers and NCOs in name only. And, and, uh, and he had been part of a, a team building exercises with the Ukrainians for the last several years to, to, uh, inculcate, inculcate, you know, American training methods, uh, and tactical uh, training, maneuver training with the Ukrainians and really brought them up to speed. Uh, so if they knew how to, to deal with the Russian advance, of course, they were highly motivated, but they had NCOs, you know, and citizen soldiers um, who could maneuver around and sabotage these tank columns coming in toward Kiev. So Kiev didn't fall, and we know what's happened since then. So I thought that was kind of a breakthrough in reporting. Um, so uh, we look, we're going to look uh, with somewhat of a critical eye of what's going on in regard to Iran, China, North Korea, and Russia. Uh, I'm going to look at Bill Burns. I think I'm going to end up writing a very positive piece about Bill Burns, which all my lefty friends will probably hate me for. Um, but uh, he, look, he looks to be doing a pretty good job. Um, it's middle management. Just like uh, the Army runs on C, uh, NCOs, um, the guys who... who these, uh, you know, it's the middle management at CIA who really uh, determine whether it works or not. The station chiefs, the middle managers, uh, and upward to senior managers to make sure things are being done right and don't cover up problems. That's always the problem in any big organization, right? The cover up is you don't want to say problem. what's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Sweep sweep the problems under the rug. So um, you just can't have that in an intelligence and military operation. You just cannot because it's lethal. You can get people killed when you do that. Um, or you can keep going in a war that you shouldn't be pursuing. So I'm hopeful that, that we're having better management at CIA because we need them to do a good job. Um, I haven't been keeping up with what's going on at NSA. That that's a little bit of a blind side for me. I'm not a cyber guy. I wish I had a regular contributor who was a, a cyber guy. As for the future of spy talk, you know, I am getting a little long in the tooth. Um, I'd I, I'd love to have uh, a, a deputy, a part time deputy, right now who I could train up into. Uh, taken over spy talk at some point uh, the daily running of spy talk uh haven't found that person yet you know it's a very specialized knowledge uh about intelligence not easy to find people who uh, i mean I, all the people who are good at it are working someplace now you know with the post the times uh wall street journal new yorker some of the the television networks there's some very very good national security and intelligence reporters there so and they're all pretty young <laughs> so um i guess the other bit of news is the, the the spy talk podcast which was suspended when i went into the hospital in july um it's going to start up again in january awesome. i'm only going to i'm just going to i'm going to do it every other week because it was just taking too much time away from the spy talk news operation jeff where can people uh, where can people find spy talk where can they find the podcast where can they find you uh thanks for asking spy talk is at spy talk dot co that's co dot co spy talk or just it's so prominent that you can just google spy talk and and i suppose you could add my name jeff stein but the spy talk dot co just Google Spy Talk. It'll it'll come up right at the top of your list. Um, uh, the same with just Google Spy Talk podcast. You'll find all the archives there. Um, my co-host was Jean Meserve, uh, the former CNN correspondent and anchor. She was great, but she's got other requirements for her time right now, so she won't be able to continue. Um, but uh, on the other hand, it'll give me a lot more, uh, some more latitude on how to do the show and the format and go into depth with uh, intelligence professionals on what they're doing or what they were doing. And so I'm looking forward to that uh, in January. 
just Google Spy Talk Podcast. It'll pop up. It's on uh, our our producer, uh, the company that produces us is MSW Media. Awesome, Jeff. And they've been great. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you have coming out next. I was keeping an eye. Actually, I get your emails every morning <laughs> about Spy Talk and what, <laughs> what you're publishing. So I hope other people go. That's and, great, Jack. Yeah, I hope people go and sign up and uh, and keep an eye on what you guys are doing. Um, some great uh, national security news. So great to, for you guys to invite me on. I'm just uh, just thrilled. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we um, appreciate your time on a Friday evening. I'm already getting critical uh, messages. <laughs> uh, uh, and one is, uh, uh, <laughs> your macro aggression makes me feel unsafe. This is somebody I know. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm talking, and he goes on to say, I'm talking about the dossier that told vicious lies about, the, I think he's talking the steel dossier, yeah, yeah, so-called yeah. steel dossier, uh, who t told lies about the Trumps and was fed piecemeal to the FBI and the Justice Department in an effort to undermine the Trump administration. It feeds into all the conspiracy theories that are developed on the right as we are learning from the Twitter Files podcast. Um Again, see, it's all of one weave. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot to unpack um, there, but um, the uh, yeah, I guess there are a lot of lies all, all, all across the board on that, uh, to say the least. <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, um, you can't once someone has really embraced that, you can't budge them. Well, yeah, from that position, and, and, and this is a a good friend of mine, and who's gone over to the like I call it with him the dark side uh, of the Trump world, and and once they're there, you, uh, I I try to avoid politics with him now because I love the man; he's a dear friend. But we can't. We're on. We're just speaking. He's. I'm speaking Swahili to him. You know. So uh, the, the challenge, like Jack <laughs> said, though, is that there's enough stuff with. Uh, Strzok and Page and and the Steele dossier and you know the FISA warrants and everything else that you know it, it's there there's 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 been malintent and 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 wrong action on both sides and generally the people on the Definitely. right people on the right will not acknowledge what what has happened on that side and people on the left will not acknowledge what's happened on that side, but it's been a, a, it's been very contentious and there, I think there are a lot of reasons why I, not QAnon and things like that, but why people, you know, and for a while, I think people saw Trump as the underdog that, that these people were, you know, against Definitely. him and, and doing things. So, you know, it, 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 it gets very messy. I think um, it, it is very messy. Yeah, you're right. Um, we have um, a we have a few questions. If uh, oh, sure. we can get to those real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, let me get there. Switch account. I don't, um, is that something I'm supposed to be hearing? Uh, no, uh, no, Dave's gonna pull them up. Okay. Yeah, I gotta pull them up. Okay. All right. Um, Ohms, thank you very much for the donation. Uh, Brendan G., thank you. Uh, love the Australian reference, uh, the Breaker Rule 0 .3, uh, 0 0.303 uh, from Breaker Marat. Um, Ahmed, uh, thank you very much for the very generous donation. Uh, what a great man. Thanks for bringing him on, on what he's saying about ignorance of the Mideast and the lack of our people's understanding of who the different players are in that region is so true. It's astonishing. Do you find that our politicians yeah. just tend to be undereducated when it comes to like uh, current events? Well, there's the, uh, uh, how could I forget this? Uh, the, the, the hidden government, you know, that uh, the Trump people are constantly talking about the, um, <laughs> help the, me out here before my state. brain is really, the deep state. Say again. The deep, deep state. state. Yeah. Thank you. How can I forget that? 
it's with us everywhere. No, there is a deep state in the sense that there's a core of professionals, uh, whether it's uh, economists or foreign policy people or intelligent people who just stay on in Washington decade after decade. You know, they work for the government for 20 or 30 years. Uh you just applying uh, this conspiracy uh, notion to them all as you know if they control things is is really ridiculous. I mean, I wish they were that competent, frankly, <laughs> in some days. But um, uh, and also, you know, nobody can keep a, a, a secret, a political secret, for five seconds in Washington. So, if there was a deep state really controlling things, um, we'd know about it. But there is a deep state in the terms of the that there there are foreign policy uh, and and the subcategories of middle east experts and so on that really know the stuff and they tend to you know dominate the policies that that come out and they're 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 middle ground people they're sort of center bending a little bit to the left but there's also a number of uh center right um experts who i also uh, talk with uh, and agree with on issues, but so it's center right to center left experts on national security and policy. They know the Middle East, or yeah, I mean, they know the players and they know the issues going on. They may have they have totally different prescriptions of what's going on and what they should be. We should be doing about it, um, but generally, um, you know. The politicians, uh, I mean, the elected officials, is that if that's who we're talking about, they, um, their main issue is getting reelected, you know, uh, it's, it's in the House, especially because they got to get reelected every two years. So, like five minutes after they're sworn in, they're on the phone trying to raise money for the next election. Right. And their main uh, interest is in pleasing their constituents uh and getting reelected. So they gotta please their constituents and in conservative rural areas that means, you know, being on the right far right. Uh Senate less so because they are six year terms. And so the senators uh can develop an expertise in a particular area and in the intelligence world that's Mark Warner, the chairman of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. Um and Menendez, uh, Bob Menendez, who's uh, involved with that and hostage issues. So they develop specialties uh, and bear down on there. And they have the luxury to do that because they're elected not from a district, but the whole state. And they can be more uh, um, fungible on their politics. Um, but, you know, so there is actually that's you know there are people, but I'd say there's there is a kind of a, a bureaucracy that kind of forms the consensus on issues that is not very broad. There hasn't been. I mean, now you've got people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who says we should all be armed, and and who said the other day that we you know January sixth would have succeeded if I had been in charge. Um, so you've got extremists now mm-hmm. over there on the right. Uh, and the extremists, quote unquote, on the left, like AOC, they're political extremists. They're not conspiring to bring down the government, you know. <laughs> um, and um, so that doesn't uh, doesn't give them a lot of time to develop expertise. There's not a lot of payback. <laughs> There's no benefit for people, for a congressman or woman, to become an expert in foreign policy. <clears throat> Because generally the feeling is we're giving away too much money. Uh, we're, we're, we're over involved in foreign countries uh, and so on. And, and, and you can't bring home the bacon as, it, as the saying goes, as a Congress, a member of Congress, when you're becoming an expert on the CIA or oversight or military right. oversight, you got to bring home a factory. You got to bring home federal aid. Even the people who, the Republicans who rail against for um, the the Biden infrastructure plan, once it was passed, they were out there taking credit for yeah, it. Yeah, remember? The, remember? <laughs> I, wasn't wasn't DeSantis going around handing out giant checks to people for the bill he he voted? Yeah, against? And, and, <laughs> and and many Republican members of Congress saying uh, this bridge is going to be repaired thanks to me. This road is going to be repaired <laughs> thanks to me. And and they had campaigned against it. You know, 
they didn't campaign against bridges and roads, but they campaigned against Biden and Democrats as given it spending too much money. But once that money was spent, they were glad to take credit for it. Uh, so our politics are so whacked up now. There used to be a general consensus about national security and foreign policy, and it wasn't all that good, to tell you the truth. I mean, you had a foreign policy consensus on that we should be in Vietnam. Yeah. You know? So, uh, and, and the people who were saying, uh, no, we shouldn't, you know, they were very much in a minority. Um, any, uh, and they were attacked as being anti-American. Do we have any more questions? We do. Um, Ahmed, thank you again. Uh, despite the damage and failures in Afghanistan and Iraq, do you think the U.S. military tech and the intelligence tradecraft are more advanced because of them? There's a lot of technological advances uh, and, and technology. The communications is a key issue uh, in, in intelligence operations. You've got to be able to communicate with your spies, right, in a very secure manner. Because there was a communications lapse um, uh, in 2005, I think it was, in, in regard to the CIA's Iran aspect uh, uh, assets, a whole CIA network was, was rolled up by the Iranians. Um, the Chinese reportedly rolled up some 20 CIA spies uh, because of a communication lapse. So there's a lot of time and money has gone into better and better communication. That's, that's so critically important. Um, uh, uh, we have these huge, there's an arms race on now with uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, for one, which I don't even really grasp myself. I don't really quite, can't get my head around the artificial intelligence. But I know it has something to do with developing hypersonic missiles, which the Russians and the Ch Chinese have both, I think both have demonstrated their hypersonic missiles now. Um, and, and I know if we're not flying them for public uh, inspection already, we're, we're working on it. Um, and um, you know that some weapons that are uh, surreptitious weapons, classified weapons systems are being worked on, tried out in Ukraine now. Uh, I think that we're giving a lot of help to the Ukrainians for targeting um, and counterintelligence. So that's a big uh, asset that the CIA brings to uh, all their foreign operations, by the way. They, they, they can help a friendly service with their communications technology. And surveillance technology, you know, of, of phone tracking, which turned, which was unleashed uh, against Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. um, uh, link tracing, uh, and so on. So you could, you could, you, you, if you could get access to one Al Qaeda phone, right. you could, you could take down a whole, network. you could diagram, you could diagram a whole network mm -hmm. of Al Qaeda people, uh, and then the drones came in. Yeah. So that was a big advance. Uh, from Unknown, uh, name redacted, I suppose. Thank you very much. Great show. Uh, and then, um, let's see here. I think the, we got a couple, a couple more, right, that popped up. Yeah, Clayton Jensen is one. Say again? Clayton asked a question. Okay. Oh, thanks, Clayton. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, do you think the U.S. intel community is handicapped by our unwillingness to play as dirty as our adversaries? Does our American righteousness hinder our ability to be effective on the battlefield? Are we too nice to win? What? Well, if anybody thinks that they're not following these, uh, the recent special forces operation in northeastern Syria, which took out a major Al Qaeda or ISIS figure just well last week. Yeah, <laughs> so we're not. We're definitely not playing nice in the Middle East. We're still we we and we took out with a drone strike. Uh, uh, the head of uh, Al Qaeda, uh, 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 Zawahiri. Um, Zawahiri, right? Took him out on I mean, what? He was standing on his balcony in Kabul. You know, we're not playing nice. We're playing. I don't know if you call that playing dirty. I think we're just playing. We're in the game, and we're going after them, and we're helping the Ukrainians strike deep within Russia. I think we are. Um. Again, with technology that we're loaning them or applying to their uh, forces, 
So no, I don't think we're not we're not play, I don't think we're not playing uh, we're playing dirty if you want to call it dirty. They're out there in the battle. They're they're out there in the trenches. The game is the game. Never changes. <laughs> and that's it for the questions. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you taking the time. I hope people go check out Spy Talk. Uh, next Friday, Me too. we're going to be on with Scott Mann. Uh, Scott Mann, former Special Forces officer. He uh, is a, uh, the lead and the producer of the, uh, the play Last Out that Dave and I went and saw. He's also um, the author of Operation Pineapple. Uh, when, you know, he was one of the guys helping the Afghans get out of uh, Kabul uh, Scott, last mm-hmm. year. Uh, Scott Mann's a really, a really good guy, really interesting guy, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll have him on the show next Friday, speaking to him. And then uh, our Christmas episode that following Friday is going to be with um, Shawnee Delaney, uh, DIA humanter. Um, super good interview. It's already recorded, so that's going to go out for uh, Christmas. So that's kind of what we have planned hey, can for I, next two weeks. Yeah, Jeff, what's can up? Can I give a plug uh-huh. yes, before we please. go? Yeah, absolutely. My- so my, uh, it, it combines intelligence and, and good works and, a, and a, a very deserving individual. My friend Ron Caps, a former Army intelligence and CIA officer, State Department officer, um, uh, is now um, writing and performing music related to his wartime experiences. And it's really, he's a fabulous, he's got a great singer, a great guitar player, and uh, I, I did a podcast about him, with him, last year. And um, you can find his music online. It's Ron Caps, C A double P S. Ron Caps. Go if you're a veteran. Go listen to his music. Go look him up and listen to his music and download it. It's really worthwhile. I met Ron because he came to me to be on the board of the Veterans Writing Project, which encourages veterans to write about their experiences and write short stories or write books, uh, which is a noble pursuit. Um, and, um, and, that, and so Ron started that up, and now he does it with music with veterans. Uh, so he's a noble figure himself, and, but um, treat yourself to his fabulous music, Ron Caps, C-A-P-P-S. That's cool. And uh, again, I hope people go check out Spy Talk, spytalk.co. And um, you know, again, Jeff, thank you. And we appreciate it. And uh, all you out there, we'll see you next Friday with Scott Mann. Hope you have a good weekend. That was really fun. (laughs) Thanks, Jeff.